Hello and good morning to our distinguished speaker from the West and good evening to our honorable chair and speaker and friends from Asia. Welcome to ACNS webinars. We have two very interesting topics coming up ahead. The first topic of which is global neurosurgery. According to the Lancet Commission on Global Health, approximately 5 million essential neurosurgical cases per year are left unaddressed in low and middle income countries. The preventable deaths due to surgical deficit are as high as 47 million annually. Global neurosurgery addresses this uneven balance of resources and needs. It is defined as an area for study, research, practice, and advocacy that places a priority on improving health outcomes and achieving health equity for all people worldwide who are affected by neurosurgical conditions or have a need for neurosurgical care. To enlighten us more about the research aspects of global neurosurgery, we are blessed with the presence of one of the most notable faces and torch bearer of global neurosurgery, the person who wrote this definition, Professor Key Park. Professor Park is the lead of the Global Neurosurgical Initiative Program in Global Surgery and Social Change. He is a lecturer at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts, USA. Professor Park is also the co-chair of the Global Neurosurgery Committee of the WFNS. We are extremely thankful to Professor Park for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from Shanghai, Professor Jun Zong. Professor Zong is the Vice Chairman of Neurosurgical Department, Sinhua Hospital, Shanghai Jiatong University of Medicine. Thanks to the Chinese population, Dr. Zong and his colleagues have completed more than 14,000 cases of MVD surgery. Thereout, he put forward a safe and easy technical strategy for this functional operation. Also, he has proposed a novel hypothesis regarding the mechanism of cranial nerve hyperexcitability disorders based on a series of experimental studies for which he was awarded the International Travel Scholarship in the 81st AANS meeting in New Orleans, USA, led by Professor Li and Zhang, the Sinhua team took the lead in drafting consensus of Chinese specialists regarding the diagnosis and treatment of trigeminal neuralgia and hemifacial spasm after publishing more than 100 relevant papers and edited four textbooks. It was also them who have established an international society named World Neurosurgical Federation of Cranial Nerve Disorders in January 2017. We are extremely thankful to Professor Jun Zong for accepting our invitation to be speaker at our webinars. The chair for today is another torchbearer in the neurosurgical education for the young neurosurgeons around the world. He's also one of the most prolific vascular surgeons of the world. It's an extreme honor to have with us Professor Shu Bin. Professor Bin is the professor of neurosurgery at the Huashan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai. Professor Bin is an integral part of our online education initiative. We are extremely grateful to him for lending his support to us as well as to other several online education societies, despite him being one of the most busiest neurosurgeons of the world. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Fato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chair to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, may I hand over this podium to Professor Shubin. Please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, first, uh, Dr. Subin, for introducing me, and of course, Raja and uh, Bunseng for organizing these webinars. You know, I, I'm, I, of course, I'm coming from the U.S., um, but I have to say I have, I'm Korean. My, my background is Korean. And the neurosurgery um, uh, in Asia and Asia Pacific and, and even Southeast Asia you know, this whole area, the population is more than 60% uh, of the globe. And I think uh, the future of neurosurgery, the pioneers, uh, the, the movement will be driven by uh, neurosurgeons in this area. So I'm really proud to be a part of this webinar series. I fully support all the um, efforts to increase the visibility of neurosurgery uh, from this region. Um, so, you know, traditionally it's been a dominance, as you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the West and in Europe. And I think that it's, 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 um, it, it's not quite warranted anymore, I will say that. And it's time for some, some, some changes and readjustments. So uh, today I will be talking about uh, research in global neurosurgery. And uh, I, I, I put a tagline, informing the path to neurosurgical equity. And I, you'll see what I'm talking about uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. So um, I don't know uh, if some of you know, I'm a, a US trained neurosurgeon, but after 10 years of private practice, I actually went to uh, Ethiopia, uh, North Korea, and also Nepal and Cambodia. 
And 2013, I moved my, my, my wife and three daughters to Cambodia to work at a government hospital. Uh, um, and so uh, I was there for about three years. And, and I started to uh, ex uh, collect data uh, because I wasn't I was, when I was working in Ethiopia, I never collected data. First of all, I'm a clinical neurosurgeon. I don't like doing research. But when I'm working overseas and trying to understand whether I'm making a difference or if the work that we're doing is actually uh, meaningful, you really have to collect data and then analyze it and, 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 and see if it's working or not. So in Cambodia, we started collecting data and, uh, and we started obviously treating neurosurgical conditions, but then there were a few things about uh, the head injuries in Cambodia that started to really uh, uh, stand out. As you all know, living in uh, uh, Asia and Southeast Asia, most of the transportation is two wheels, right? Not road uh, car injuries, but so much as the pedestrian and, and motorcycles. And, and in Cambodia, what we were seeing is that the people coming in with head injury, 90% uh, uh, of them were not wearing any helmets, which is astounding because this was actually a loss to, uh, to, to, to wear helmets. And then, uh, uh, you know, in high income countries like the US or even you know, Europe, the, the proportion of epidural versus uh, uh, subdurals is less than 10%. Epidurals are going away because of helmets. But you, in Cambodia, we were seeing more than half the cases that we we're operating on were epidurals. And you all know that the pathophysiology of epidurals, it's once you take the blood clot out, the patients do really well because the, the, the brain matrix, the, the tissue itself is, is, is okay. So then we started to compare the usage of helmets with um, their, their Glasgow Coma Scale upon presentation, which we show that they were much worse off than people who were wearing helmets. The need for craniotomy was increased. And more importantly, um, their Glasgow Outcome Scale, when they were being discharged, were worse, significantly worse, if you did not wear a helmet. And we started to publish these results. And then we actually uh, wrote uh, within the Cambodian literature, uh, uh, lay literature, and wrote opinion pieces and about two years later, there was a move uh, by the Cambodian government to, uh, 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 for a comprehensive helmet laws. And it was really gratifying to see that. It wasn't just us, there were other groups working on this, but we certainly played a part in it. And this is where, I, uh, for me, research is, was powerful. You know, we can save lives through uh, uh, doing fantastic surgery, technically ma you know, master masterful operations, and, and, and one, sur one surgery at a time. But here's a case where a neurosurgeon or group of a neurosurgical team by collecting data and analyze and advocating for better policies, we can save lives too. And so this is a, a, an area of uh, public health practice of neurosurgery that I think a lot of people just uh, either are not aware or, or, or just you know, don't have a lot of skills in. And I would encourage people to think about you know, the other aspects of neurosurgical care, not just technical expertise, but things that impact public health aspects of neurosurgical conditions. So in 2015, there was a research article uh, that came out in the Lancet outlining uh, and highlighting the, the tremendous uh, uh, gap in surgical care, not neurosurgical, surgical care around the world. 143 operations each year are not being done when they're needed. And these are people, and then, then, then because of that, people are either dying or, or, or becoming disabled. Uh, five billion people were not, uh, do not have access to surgical care. And you can see in this map, Asia and Southeast Asia is fully in that red zone, as well as of course, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, which always, is, has always struggled to provide uh, a, a robust healthcare to their population. And in conjunction with another research uh, uh, book called The Disease Control Priorities, and which devoted the entire first volume on essential surgery, there was a groundswell of interest within policymakers. This is ministries of health, governments, to come together at the, at the annual World, World Health Assembly and pass a resolution calling for strengthening emergency and essential surgical care and anesthesia as a component of universal health coverage. That changed everything for us. This, is, this meant that ministries of health, whether it's China or Malaysia or, or uh, Zambia or, 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 or Fiji, they had a responsibility to, uh, a res uh, to, to implement components of this resolution, which call for strengthening of surgical care 
including neurosurgical care at the national level. So what does that look like? Initially, they, we recommend that the governments actually start with a, a, a strategic plan, a gap analysis of where their surgical services are, and then come up with a vision for the country and, and, and develop a multi-year uh, plan to in increase workforce, uh, infrastructure, equipment, service delivery, financing, and those kinds of health system domains that we don't really talk about. And this is happening in, in over 50 countries at, at this point. Fiji, just two days ago, finished their initial stakeholder meeting. And I'm happy to report that their sole neurosurgeon, Dr. Alan Biribo, was at the stakeholder meeting, providing very, very valuable input as neurosurgeon to the national plan to develop surgical care throughout the entire country, right? This is why neurosurgeons, number one, have to be at the table. Number two, we need to have evidence to provide to the policymakers. Once again, uh, highlighting the need to uh, uh, conduct meaningful research in the public health aspect of, of, of neurosurgery. Um, this is just a couple of webinars that's, that just happened and with a third one that's coming up and just to indicate the level of interest, the high level of interest within global health governance. Uh, we just had a webinar with uh, Professor Takeshi Kasai. Well, it's Dr. Takeshi, Takeshi Kasai. He's the regional director for the Western Pacific WHO region. And Dr. Poonam Singh, she's the regional director for the entire Southeast Asia regional office for WHO. They are both the, uh, fully committed to supporting member states scaling up surgical care nationally. We also had speakers from the World Bank Dr. Jim Young King and Dr. Mohammed Ali Pate, and they're all fully supporting surgical scale up in, at, at, at a very grand scale. These are massive uh, hundreds of millions of dollar projects where they will train neurosurgeons, uh, including neurosurgeons, build out hospitals, uh, nurses, anesthesiologists, and so on. So I just want to uh, shift a little bit about global neurosurgery and where our roots are once again, goes back to an incredibly powerful research uh, article at Lancet in May 2015. Same thing that's jump-started the global surgery movement really pushed neurosurgeons to, to, to develop this idea of global neurosurgery. And of course, this was in 2015, uh, a following year in Bogota at the international, uh, uh, the, the ICRAN meeting, the neurotrauma meeting, um, there was a Bogota declaration where uh, Walter Johnson from WHO was there. Franco Servadai, the, the, the president of the World Federation, was there. And we, we declared that the, there is an unmet, a massive unmet need for, uh, for, for neurosurgical care globally. And more importantly, the responsibility to address that rely, is squarely on the shoulders of neurosurgeons. It's our responsibility as caretakers of neurosurgical conditions. So what does research look like in global surgery? Uh, first thing that you know, we did at the program in global neurosurgery at, at, at Harvard Medical School, we wanted to do a, a, a situational analysis, right? And we followed the rule book that the Lancet Commission in Global Surgery did. We wanted to know how many uh, neurosurgical operations are currently unmet. And we came up with a number uh, by analyzing 10 different uh, buckets of neurosurgical conditions. Five million neurosurgical operations that need to be done are not being done. So this is head injuries, uh, spine injuries, tumors. They get, they don't, they, they just don't get any operations. And what happens to them? Uh, obviously, uh, they unnecessarily uh, end up dying or becoming disabled. And that's truly not fair. And this is 2021. This should not be happening. These are all other. These are our fellow human beings who are not getting neurosurgical case uh, uh, care that they need. Then we also calculated the number of neurosurgeons. Uh, that would be needed additional neurosurgeons to meet this extra uh, uh, capacity, a uh, med capacity. Uh, we also know that there's about 49,000 neurosurgeons around the world. And based on our unmet, uh, the, the 5 million caseload, we estimated additional 23,000 neurosurgeons are needed today. We need them right now to meet this demand. And, and so we need to get busy and train neurosurgeons as many as possible, but not just neurosurgeons. We need to train nurses, anesthesiologists, and improve and, and strengthen uh, uh, health systems. So that's one of the, our, our baseline uh, landmark uh, 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 research that we produced at the, at the program Global Surgery. And I mentioned these uh, national surgical plans that are in process, and they use a specific WHO framework for health systems. Um, 
uh, infrastructure, workforce, service delivery, uh, governance, those kinds of things. These are the six domains of a strong uh, building, what they call building blocks of a health system. Uh, the Ministry of Health is not, is interested of course on clinical excellence. What they really need to know and understand is how do they strength, strength, uh, build up a, a health system to meet the population's needs? So they have questions like, how many neurosurgical facilities does a country need, right? And that, base, that is based on the volume as well as the ur urgency of neurosurgical conditions. So we were able to show, at least from data from Cambodia, that after about four hours, the Glasgow outcome scale deteriorates uh, very, very rapidly. So we suggested that you may have up to four hours before a, a traumatic, a TBI, let's say, to get that person to a, a neurotrauma facility. That, that has a lot of implications. You know, it doesn't mean to, it, 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 you, it, that allows the ministries of health to figure out that these places to, you know, as they, as they scale up neurosurgical services, that they could be as far as maybe seven or eight hours apart, right? So because if an accident happens here, they have to be at least four hours away from one of the uh, facilities with neurosurgeons and CT, CT scanners and so on and so forth. So that's one of the things that we help generate. The other one is how many neurosurgeons should they plan to produce, right? Do they, do they, you know, so if, given that, that particular country, we calculated globally, we needed 23,000 neurosurgeons, but a, a ministry of health wants to know, okay, uh, we have a population of a million. How many do we need for our country? And we're able to calculate that uh, for about every 200,000 people, you should have at least one neurosurgeon uh, to at least meet the neurotrauma demands of that population. So these are kinds of research questions that I don't think that most of us think about. You know, we, thought, we think about outcomes after uh, into, uh, a surgical technique and whether it's safe and efficacious and what are the complication rates. And those things absolutely should continue. We should still should try, should try to improve clinical excellence and push the envelope of, of, te of technology but the public health aspects of neurosurgical care, there's a massive gap in, in, in research produ uh, productivity. So one of the things that the World Federation of Neurosurgical Society has done to respond to this unmet neurosurgical uh, uh, needs is to create a global neurosurgery committee. And uh, uh, Franco Servadai asked me and Dr. El Huhabi from Rabat, uh, Morocco to co-chair this committee. And so we've, uh, once, one of the first things that we did was let's make sure that everybody really understands what we mean when we say global neurosurgery, because it was clear that when we talk to people, we get all kinds of different definitions. One person would say, well, yeah, we do mission work or, you know, we go to their meetings that come to our meetings. No, those are not exactly what we're talking about. And so we went ahead and, 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 and created a definition that we can all agree on. Global neurosurgery is the clinical, right? So the how to, taking care of patients and public health, right? The population-based uh, issues, the public health practice of neurosurgery with the primary purpose of ensuring timely, right? We wanna make sure that people can get there within a certain amount of time, safe, because safety and quality of surgical care is just as important. If you just provide access to neurosurgical care, but the safety, it's not high quality. It's really, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And the last thing is affordable, right? So you can have a hospital right in front of you and then you, you have a TBI, you know, you, let's say a family member has a, has a son that's, that's an that epidural, but the surgeon says, yeah, but we'll do your surgery or, but you need to pay X amount of money. And the family just doesn't have that kind of money. And that's completely uh, morally absurd. We, you know, we, know we, we should not withhold care uh, before they can pay. It, 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 that, that's, that's immoral. So we want to make sure it's affordable neurosurgical care. And the, here's a, the, 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 who, who is this for? It's for everyone, right? We're all in this together. We should not have people living in certain parts of the country of the world have all the neurosurgical care that they could have. And then you go to another country where they're dying of simple uh, uh, you know, neuros uh, epidurals, for instance. And that's just to me, uh, unacceptable in, in 2021. So that's the definition of global neurosurgery. And we developed the global action plan. And, and what is that? Uh, uh, there, there are five broad objectives uh, within this action plan and we're actually implementing it as we speak. And these are what we call five A's. Uh, so the first A is amplify. We, yeah, we actually amplify access to timely, safe, affordable neurosurgical care, as I just mentioned. 
we also want to align all global neurosurgery activity. Uh, you know, let's say in, in Ethiopia, we have team from Norway working in, in, in this one university and team from America working on another place. You know, there's no coordination happening. We wanted to try to bring together all the actors in a given country and then work with the ministries of health and work with academic medical centers within that country so that their work is coordinated and, and moves towards a unified goal for that country. And so that's the aligned goal uh, objective. And here's the one about research. We wanna advance relevant research, especially from authors from the developing world. Franco Cerveda has said this for years. He said 80% of neurotrauma cases uh, uh, in the world occur in, in lower and middle income countries. And that's true. But if you look at the medical literature on how to take care of it and understand it better, 80% of the literature comes from high income countries. And I can tell you from working in the US and, Ethiopia, and then Ethiopia and Cambodia, that the epidemiology is different. The, the standard of care is, is very different because the resources are limited. So you cannot take information and research that generated in high income countries and directly apply it in a lower income setting. It's just not generalizable in that fashion. So we need to understand how, what, what are the conditions and what, what are the valid ways to take care of patients. And that means we need to uh, encourage research productivity within these countries, data collection and research uh, capacity building. The other uh, A is assimilate. We don't want a situation where we have neurotrauma centers all around Ethiopia, for instance, and then their surgical systems lacking. We're not building a neurosurgical center a franchise model. What we want is a build, we wanna be part of the overall surgical, surgical system strengthening a project and make sure that neurosurgery is part of that. We have to work with other surgical subspecialties, trauma, uh, um, pediatrics, all the others, because we all share some common resources. And lastly, I would argue that neurosurgeons, whether you're living in China, US or, or Europe or Africa, we're highly respected. You know, we're, 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 we're highly for our professionalism uh, and our status. We should lend our vo that, that particular uh, 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 status to the advocacy efforts and, and, and make our voice heard and making sure that surgical systems are strengthened in these countries. Uh, and then of course, have better healthcare for all, like things like universal health coverage. So uh, within the, uh, the advanced research objective, we actually have uh, 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 seven targets. Uh, these are time-bound measurable targets that we, 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 we gave ourselves to achieve actually by end of this year. The first one is we wanna map the research output by region and themes, and we wanna track it, right? Because we wanna encourage research to be generated from low-income countries and low- and middle-income countries. Well, we can't manage what we don't measure. So we have to see what that, that output looks like. And we did that. So the green means it's been done already. Uh, the other, next, next one is how do we stimulate and promote research productivity from LMICs? Can we establish a global neurosurgery research grant? We actually uh, have that now. We have a donor who's been able to provide us with money so that a researcher from a lower and middle income country can be awarded uh, 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 a, a actual money uh, for uh, excellent research in that uh, in global neurosurgery topic. Uh, advocate for global uh, major uh, uh, neurosurgery journals to include global neurosurgery category or sections. That's happening. All the major neurosurgical journals are now starting to include global neurosurgery type of articles or sections in, the, in, their, uh, uh, in their journals. Um, can we establish a funding mechanism for training future leaders in global neurosurgery? That's a little bit more challenging, but we're talking to CNS about that right now. Uh, we want to include global neurosurgery sessions in major international uh, neurosurgery meetings. That's, we've been very successful doing that and it's increasing all, all the time. And here's the, the last part is, is the establishing mentorship. We, you, know, you, need, you need to really have people who know what, the, uh, who have experience to really work with the people who can need a little coaching uh, to, 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 to become better authors and including better editorial you know, uh, board members. And we want to re uh, create that between high income and low income countries. So what does research output in global neurosurgery look like recently? The, so here's the good news, right? Uh, starting in 2015, 2016, um, uh, I wrote an article with uh, the Dr. Walter Johnson and, and Bob Dempsey about global neurosurgery. It was titled Global Neurosurgery, The Unmet Need. And that was published early 2016. And there has been an explosion of, uh, of articles 
within uh, 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 neurosurgical literature that now uses the term global neurosurgery. And this continues to grow. So that is, the, the trend is very promising and there, it, the research output is literally exploding. Now, if that's the good part, but the pro and also this, this, this phenomenon of increased explosive uh, increase in neurosurgical literature, uh, global neurosurgical literature was, was uh, uh, incorporated into Dr. Jim Kim's lecture at the AANS annual meeting as Cushing Oration. And he highlighted this, this global neurosurgery movement as one of the bright spots within the neurosurgical uh, profession. But that's the good news. Now let's look at uh, look under the sheets, if you will, right? So that we've got this explosion. But what exactly? Where are those articles coming from? And exactly what type of themes are they are they studying? So we wanted to look at uh, the research output by these public health themes, right? Service delivery, workforce, infrastructure, and financing. And then we also wanted to see whether the primary, the first authors of, is is from LMIC or high income country. So. First of all, the number of manuscripts is 20 at 2022. 20, this is looking at last 15 years, okay? This is not, you know, last year alone. Last 15 years, all global neurosurgery type of, uh, so, so the, the, even though it's exploding, the absolute number is minuscule. It's, 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 it's a drop in the bucket compared to all the other uh, neurosurgical research that's being conducted. You know, I think global, uh, world neurosurgery, they got 8,000, 9,000 submissions last year, right? Uh, same thing with the, the Journal of Neurosurgery. So there are massive numbers of research being done, but global neurosurgery research is, is uh, although it's increasing, very small numbers still. So let's look at you know the kind of uh, volume. So number one is service delivery topic. This is how to improve delivery of cervical uh, neurosurgical care. That's great. That's the, the that's the highest pillar. Uh, the the, col the column with like 22 articles, and about half and half, right? That half of the papers, uh, author, prime, first author was from LMIC and the other half was coming from a high income country. Workforce was the second category and that's normal because we really understand training uh, uh, well and then we try to do that uh, naturally in uh, developing countries. That's how I got started. You know, Ethiopia teaching neurosurgery, Cambodia teaching neurosurgery. Now, here's the bad part is, uh, 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 Almost all the papers are written by authors from high income country, like myself. Only, only just a small number uh, of papers actually written by neurosurgeons from LMICs who are being trained. So this is an, uh, it's a very lopsided situation. And we wanna see that uh, trend change. We wanna actually have more papers coming from authors from LMIC and, and talking about training and, and, and workforce. Infrastructure, same thing. Most of the papers coming from high income countries Financing, the affordability of it, about half and half and information management. Uh, uh, it's just only a handful of papers, like three papers. And what, what we're missing here is the sixth uh, uh, domain of health system governance. There's zero papers on governance of neurosurgical care delivery in, 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 in the developing world. So that's a, that's a massive research gap. So we actually took these manuscripts, and this is a paper by uh, Eddie Ham, and he's gonna be actually working with the global neurosurgery team at Harvard uh, next year. Uh, and this is 63 manuscripts total, uh, and service delivery, workforce, infrastructure, financing, and then we sort of broke it down to sort of sub-themes, uh, assessing neurosurgical volume. This is the paper that we, we did the 5 million uh, operations that are unmet. Uh, there's the education, there's edu uh, uh, access to neurosurgical care, neurosurgical equipment. So you can see sort of the, the sub themes. And so here's at a glance, you can see that number one, we need to increase uh, uh, research output in all categories, but specifically uh, the areas where we're, there's almost very little literature is, uh, has to do with financing, information management, and governance. And those are the areas I think we should really try to uh, have a concerted effort to, to, to generate more research. So I'm gonna uh, finish up with this one paper that was just published yesterday or two days ago uh, by one of our former uh, research associates. His name is Ulrich uh, Sidney, he's Cameroonian. Uh, he's a young man and watch out for this guy, he's gonna be something. And he, pub he and his researchers and almost all, I think all the authors are from uh, uh, Africa, which is incredible. And they uh, uh, published this paper in uh, Neurosurgery Open. And I think the date was March 11th, which was literally two days ago. And they tried to map global neurosurgery research uh, collaboratives. And they used very interesting techniques to look at uh, uh, how those research is related and what the trends are. And I thought this was one of the most brilliant 
a type of research that, that's been done to analyze research trends. So uh, here's the document coupling. So this is the most cited papers in global neurosurgery. Duan is the first one, and he's the one that published on that uh, 5 million uh, neurosurgical operations and then the 23,000 uh, neurosurgeons that are, that, are, that are needed. That's, that's, this, this is the paper. And that is the most number of citations, 102 citations. Then, then the, the other second paper is the one I wrote uh, five years ago now with Dr. Dempsey and, and Walter Johnson. Dylan Elegala wrote about this in 2014 about, uh, I think, uh, rural neurosurgery in Africa. So you can see some of these um, May, uh, the most uh, cited um, uh, papers in global neurosurgery. But what's interesting is that uh, Ulrich uh, used this visualization tool to show the links between it. So the, this is the, this, the, 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 the size of the circle has to do with the number of times that the paper is being cited and then uh, who's citing who. So this is uh, my paper from 2016, but then, then there's Juan's paper from 2018. That's that uh, 5 million paper. And you can see, uh, this is the pediatric uh, neurosurgery papers down here, the blue papers. And then uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the Elegala paper. And over here, uh, these are more in the uh, Morocco uh, African uh, group. And then the, uh, they, they've been producing papers and then, then they, they cite each other. And of course they cite back to the Duhan and, and, and Parks paper. Now this has to do with collaboration. Who's writing papers on global surgery and who are they working with? And so you can see the different major groups of, 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 of re research centers, if you will. So you've got, um, this is the, uh, the Duke group over here on the left with brown and blue. And these are, Duke has had a long-term relationship with uh, 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 universities in Uganda, and they have a formal global neurosurgery. I think it's called Duke Neuro Neurology, Global Neurology and Neurosurgery Inst uh, Center or something like that. And, and so they are very, they have a full-time researcher and a team of uh, uh, researchers um, uh, uh, working on producing these, these papers. This is, the, the middle is the programming global surgery at Harvard Medical School, which I lead. And these, uh, the, these are the people that we collaborate with Duke people. We collaborate with these uh, Duan's group, Jackie Corley's group. We, this is uh, WFNS, Franco Servadai, and this is uh, Angelo Acolias from the, uh, the Cambridge group. So we try to reach out to as many groups to collaborate as possible. And then the dark blue is the uh, Morocco, uh, the, the, the Rabat Training Center. And then you have this sort of um, an outlier, Mark Bernstein is at University of Toronto. And, uh, uh, and then they've been doing some incredible work, but it, what, it, what this shows is that the, the Toronto, University of Toronto group uh, does not really collaborate as much. Uh, and, and so this shows you the, the level of collections and who's, who's working with, with, with who. Uh, okay, now this is a really interesting uh, uh, visualization. And this looked at uh, thematic areas, actual terms of these papers that are being uh, 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 published. And of course, you know, the, the size of the circle shows you how often it's being used. So there's global surgery, overall surgical system strengthening, global neurosurgery. Um, and then you have things like um, country-wise, Uganda, conditions, myelomeningocele, uh, things like procedures like choroid plexus cauterization. And I want you to look at this, uh, this bar on the bottom. The dark colors are uh, from four years ago, four or five years ago, all right? And then as we go from dark to yellow, sort of, sort of, sort of dark blue to green to yellow, that's the time transition. So 2019, the more, the yellow is the most recent type of articles. So what you're seeing is a shift, shift from the blue, dark blue to yellow. And then if you look at the themes, the dark blues, things are like uh, hydrocephalus, ventriculostomy, um, emergency neurosurgery, myelomeningocele. These are, they were talking more about procedures and conditions four or five years ago, right? That's just, that was sort of where, where these things, these papers are. And then about two, three years ago, we started talking about global neurosurgery, epidemiology, uh, 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 barriers. And then, and then more recently, the yellow themes, so if you look over here, myelomeningocele's, oh, that, no, that's over here. They're going to things like workforce, uh, World Health Assembly, capacity, barriers. Uh, so we're moving now from conditions and procedures gradually into the public health domains of, of health systems. Uh, uh, workforce and training and those kinds of issues. And this is exactly what we wanna see. We wanna see the, the shift of research going to the 
overall population-based issues. Yeah, we want to still talk about what procedures are uh, possible and can be done safe and efficaciously in a low resource setting. That needs to continue, but we need to actually make these yellow uh, circles become bigger and bigger and, and almost big as global neurosurgery as we go and try to understand health system uh, uh, better. So, uh, uh, and, then, and then this is my uh, second to last uh, slide. Uh, how do we get global neurosurgery uh, articles published in, in, in the literature? And so most of us, you know, I don't know about you guys, but you know, in, in academic uh, medical centers, you know, we're, uh, we're encouraged to publish as much as possible. Well, one of the main barriers of, of, for publishing is publication fee. Some people call it the article uh, processing charge or article publication fee or charge. These are, these are, this is what the um, journals actually want to be paid. We have to pay them to, once our article is accepted, if you want them to publish it, you have to pay them um, 5,000, 6,000. Now Nature was just in the news a few months ago saying they raised their fee to 9,000 US dollars. This is for research that, that the journals don't pay for the research. Let's be honest, okay? We do all the hard work. We do the data collection, do the research. We even get the grants from other places to conduct it. We have our finished product and then we send it to the, the journals and they're gonna charge us and thousands of dollars to publish it. And what do they do when, when people wanna read it? They charge you again. They say, okay, for, if you wanna download this article, uh, please uh, pay $39 and then, you know, it, to, to read it. That's absurd. Why, why, why should we do that? Uh, this goes against everything uh, that we're trying to do, which is to uh, bring uh, information and share it with as many people as possible and encourage uh, data collection and research capacity building in, in developing countries. This is not the way to do it. So uh, in response to this sort of uh, archaic and somewhat uh, you know, brutal system of, of, of commercialized medical publishing, we came up with <clears throat> a new journal and this is an idea from Andres Rubiano, my good friend from Bogota, Colombia. And this Journal of Global Neurosurgery, and we have a website and a Twitter handle, it's on the bottom. It's not, it's, it's up, but it, there's no content because we have an inaugural issue coming up in about a month. So the, when you go there, you won't be able to see anything, but be ready because we'll put all the word out there and we'll have our inaugural issue uh, just, in a few, just a few short weeks. But what this journal will do is, is a completely nonprofit venture. We don't, this is not designed to make money, but it's a provide a service. And what it will do is to, uh, to publish uh, uh, peer reviewed uh, articles about global neurosurgery, right? The public health and the clinical aspects of it, equity, the health systems, those kinds of issues. And, and uh, with zero article processing fee, there's no, no money charged. And of course, there will be, it will be open access. Anyone can read it anytime, any place. If they have internet, boom, they can read it. It's free of charge. And we'll fund this through grants and things like that. We'll also provide a, an extra service. And this is what you see, we're trying to see some trends in this where, uh, where they're providing assistance to researchers who might quite not have the same skills as other researchers. And I'm talking about researchers from developing world. They don't have the statistical uh, expertise, language skills are clearly a challenge for them. Many, many challenges face their way, you know, fa face them, whereas people living in the US or Europe, for them, it's easy. It really is easy because they have all the training that they need. And so we would like to try to give the, uh, the, the researchers from these developing world extra help uh, through an accompaniment model. So they will provide language assistance study design, data collection, you know, all the analysis uh, assistance free of charge and, and, and no expectations of co-authorship. It was just, it, it's just a way to get them an extra help so that they can compete with the, uh, the, the authors from uh, developed countries. And we, what we hope is we will create a, a larger pool of, of, of competent uh, uh, and excellent uh, neuro, neurosurg global neurosurgery researchers, because that's what we were working on that will be able to submit to these first tier journals like the White Journal, the, Google, the World Neurosurgery and, and things like that. So um, that's what we're working on. And this is what, you know, the, uh, what we mean by research and, and global neurosurgery. And, and, and you know, we hope you all will consider submitting your papers in the areas that, that we're interested in uh, to the new journal. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Professor Park. Thank you for this such a lecture full of mission and the responsibility. So uh, I think this kind of uh, work need a lot of co cooperation from the government, <clears throat> from different uh, developing countries. So uh, do you have a official uh, organization cooperate with them? No, uh, Dr. Zubin, you're, you're, you're yeah. absolutely right. So when I was working in Ethiopia, uh, mm -hmm. Nepal, uh, and then in, in Cambodia, you know, uh, so I'll give you an example in Cambodia. We met with the Ministry of Health and saying, you know, you, 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 you're, there's a shortage of neurosurgeons in your country. And, and um, you know, you need a, a lot more neurosurgeons in the northern part of the country, et cetera, and more equipment, including CAT scanners. And it was for them kind of, uh, yes, thank you for telling us, but we have so many other things we have to do, okay? <laughs> so, they, yeah. but, so here's what happened. That, that resolution mm -hmm. in 2016, uh, 2015, uh, 2015 at the World Health Assembly, that changed everything. That, mm -hmm. lot, that, that gave mandates to the ministries of health to come back every year to Geneva and report on this uh, progress of the resolution. Now they have to, you know, the, the Ministry of Health has to be, uh, 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 they come to us and say, all right, tell us how we're supposed to scale up surgical care, because they have to now report back to Geneva, you see. So it, it's, um, uh, ministries are now, uh, 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 they have put surgical care as, 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 as one of their uh, uh, priorities. And then uh, uh, neurosurgery, of course, has to be one of those uh, uh, subspecialties that, that, that's, you know, that feeds that information and, and guides the governments uh, as they scale up. There, there is no one organization that's working on this. It's a really a, a community of, of people, academic medical centers, uh, academia like us, researchers. Uh, there's an advocacy organization called G4 Alliance composed of all the surgical stakeholders around the world, uh, 70 organizations. Um, and then, of course, professional societies like uh, uh, World uh, uh, International College of Surgeons, a World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, actually one of the key organizations in the G4 Alliance. So there's, it's, it's a really a, a coalition of people working together. Okay, thank you. I think this topic is a, a quite new to most of the neurosurgeons. So maybe... Uh, you can uh, send some uh, training programs to the SNS, and we can we can uh, go for some adver advertisement for you. <laughs> yeah, I would like to try to increase uh, our, our mm -hmm. relationship. Uh, you know, first of all, global neurosurgery shouldn't only only be about sub-Saharan Africa, right? I mean, in, in India and, and is huge. And then there are yeah. parts of Southeast Asia, you know, Bangladesh, even Myanmar. And until the, the, the recent coup, there was a strong interest by the Minister of Health uh, in, in, in scaling up surgical and neurosurgical care. So I wanted to really strengthen um, the, the, the links to global neurosurgery to Asian, key Asian stakeholders. So I just, I was telling you earlier, we have a fellowship program at the Harvard Global mm -hmm. Surgery uh, Program. And, and I directed global neurosurgery team, and we have uh, Radzi uh, 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 Hamza. Uh, uh, he's um, Malaysian, and he's 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 he's, he's going to be our first Asian uh, fellow in global neurosurgery uh, at, at Harvard. And we want to bring others. And and so what we do is we train future leaders in, in global neurosurgery. We don't actually go and do operations in, in in Bangladesh, for instance. We don't provide equipment, but we we do research and then try to work at the high levels with, with ministries of health and push neurosurgery uh, as, a, as, as a public health priority. So I would love to get more applicants from Asia. Okay, so uh, a personal question for you. So yes. how many, uh, how, how, uh, how long time you spend every time to go abroad for this kind of training? Oh, so, so the training mm -hmm. is, is in research mm -hmm. methods, policy development, advocacy, those kinds of things. So, so, so it's the public health aspects of it. So if Razi comes to, he's, he's coming uh, and then he'll be trained how to conduct 
a, a population-based research. He'll be, he'll be very uh, comfortable with talking to ministries of health and using the language that they use because they don't understand post-op mm -hmm. care. They don't understand intracranial pressure, but they understand how many neurosurgeons do we need, you know, and, and what are the, uh, the, the ancillary services that are required for, and what's our burden, a neurosurgical disease burden in our country. So, so it's a different language. So that's where we train, how we train these, these fellows so they can go back and become system level change makers in their country. Okay, it's not, thank you, it's not thank you so operate. much. Yeah, it's not my <laughs> Yeah, 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 I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> they have to be good at that too, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay. Thank you, thank you, Professor Park. Thank you. So now let's welcome the next speaker. Uh, Professor Zhong Chun from uh, China, Shanghai. Uh, his topic is uh, uh, about his uh, personal philosophy on microvascular uh, decompression. So first of all, I'd like to thank you the invitation of Asia Congress of Neurosurgery. Also, I'd like to present my thanks to Professor Xu Bing for his recommendation. So that's the opportunity to share my experience with microvascular decompression. That's the procedure I love most because this is functional neurosurgery. After surgery, the patient can improve like the normal person, not like the malignant tumor. After that, the patient have to go chemotherapy. That's, uh, I don't think that's the outcome, but for this surgery, we got an excellent outcome. So I love this surgery. So today I'd like to share my experience with you guys. First of all, I'd like, it didn't move. Okay, I'd like to say hello to, to the chairman. I thought Professor Gail Russell was supposed to be the chairman today, but I didn't see her. Anyway, I just make a memory to, for the first meet her in 2006, that means 17 years. 15 years ago. So we got a lot of chance to meet. The last one is uh, 2018. Anyway, it's skipped it. So why I love this so the most? Because we have a lot of experience. Thanks to the Chinese population, we accomplished, accomplished more than 10,000 MVDs. And you know, this is a mm, disease likely to be occur in Asian people because the anatomical character likes. So that's the reason we got a lot of patients. So now I gave you guys a question. What's the most important thing for this functional neurosurgery? So a lot of people would say, uh, the most important thing is to isolate the neurovascular confliction. So a lot of Japanese, um, academic, the professor, they would uh, suggest, uh, they would uh, love to do the technique, they call the transposition, it's larger than interposition. They stress that we should uh, move the affinity artery away, not just to put some tefal between them. That's true. But my answer is most important thing is the safety. Always should put the safety first, because this is functional neurosurgery. Officers, you don't want to see the patient to get some policy, the death, or even get died. So that's um, acceptable. So I would suggest, I mean, if you if you employ a lot of complicated techniques and you put a lot of ill tumors inside the surgical field, the foreign body, I mean, the tools. The, the teflon, a gel something like a, a plate or a cotton oil, because that's the falling body. The more falling body, more complicated technique, the more time, of course, you've got more chance of post-operative complications. So we should avoid that. So I would suggest three notes. The first note, or before that, I would say, I would suggest that the operation should be performed easily. I always uh, tell my fellow, I said, don't make it complicated, but take it easy. So in English, to complete the process with minimal procedures in this time. 
Now I said the three nodes. The so number one, there's no complete technical. Number two, no unnecessary instrument into the surgical field. Number three, no waste manipulation. Let's move to the number one, no complicated technique. As early as I think this is uh, 2011, maybe 10 years ago, a lot of people, actually this is a little to the image. So the, the topic is, uh, I said, uh, ideal microvascular decompression technique should be simple and safe. So I refer to the paper written by Japanese also. He mentioned a slim technique. So I, I say the slim technique is uh, too complicated because this procedure, we, you, you have to use the strider to passing around the artery and then stitch a notch. So that's make it too complicated in such a, a small surgical field. So that's not easy. I will show you what I do for this complicated case. This is a, a very large twist ectatic vertebral artery, vertebral vessel artery. So that's the problem, that's tough. So this is the number one, the first picture. Well, this is the left side, she jammed the radio case. This is Tentoria, Petrosol. And in the surgical, in the operative, a microscopic view, we didn't see the fifth node, no fifth at all, just but some um, petrol veins. And here we see a large vertebral artery. Where I pour uh, the ventry a bit, I saw the ventral vertebral artery here. And that's the affinity artery. He just push it the fifth node to the tentorial. So that means tough. You can't, there's no room make a thread to, to sling, the, to, to, to pull the vertebral artery out. That's impossible. So what I do, move the microscope caudally. And this side, this means caudally, caudal nerves. This is the eight, nine, 10, 11. Here, the very, Caudary and the move the vertebral artery to the laterally and the proximally, and the one by one between the caudal nerves, put some tefron to move it uh, out uh, laterally. So when you move this way, like to the culture, to the lustra, you will find finally the artery already. Uh, move away from the fifth node. So to confirm, I also put some Teflon film. Now I think I can use the space. No Teflon at all, it's okay. So such complicated case, I can move it. Just a lot of dissection, anatomy, the, the dissection here, well, to make it easy. So that's the general case. And compare with the preoperative, the first picture like this, the vertebra artery here, and the trigeminal node is just here behind the, the petrol veins. And after surgery, here, the vertebra artery move proximally, so solve the problem. And uh, only in some extreme case, I use screw, but no sling at all. So this is the right side to geminal cast. I would uh, cut the arachnoid uh, sufficiently. This is a uh, uh, cutting now, and here's uh, the trigeminal now. I just opened the arachnoid sufficiently. And uh, what I already done, I can put some type of here to put it uh, later, but it's impossible because it's too twisted. And finally, I found still has a lot of stress here toward the trigeminal node. So I just put some teflon, like uh, uh, make a basement, put some uh, glue and keep the vertebral artery to the petrol bone for a minute, a couple of minutes, one or two minutes, it's okay. So that's just for uh, lots of uh, cases, just uh, 
um, around the 10,000 among them just uh, less than 10 cats I do this. Okay, it's more forward. And uh, this is a uh, uh, hemifacial case. This is the right side. I make it simple. For this case, where I dissect the cautery, I found just uh, actually here, not, not the, this sister segment, just here. I put some typhoon, not typhoon, Jephon, just a Jephon, because Jephon can absorb after a couple of weeks. So that means easy, no typhoon at all. We don't need typhoon because this is a, a soft vessel. It can keep the position. It won't be bound again. So even the uh, Jephon absorbed after a couple of weeks. So sometimes even no typhoon will need it either. And the number two, the second now is less instruments in the operative field. Um, I will show you the picture. Just no spatula. I didn't put any spatula bread at all. No bread at all. Zero detraction. The cotton knot is my bread, actually. I just uh, use in my left side the suction tuber and in my right side hand micro dissector. It's okay. That can finish the, the complete the all per the compression procedure. Because, you know, a narrow suction tuber can actually offer the more rooms than a wider spatula does at a moment where a local area is being dissected. You can imagine the narrow section can offer you more rooms just uh, this side. So if you're familiar with the anatomy, the local anatomy, we don't need to expose you the whole surgical field. You don't need to, 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 to see the whole uh, field because you just could do it one by one, one by one. The, the whole anatomy should be in your mind. And the, the satisfactory working space is obtained by sharp dissection of arachnoid rather than the tract of cerebellar. So sometimes I just make it more easy. When I put the teflon, I do, don't use the, uh, the, the forceps. I just use the micro dissect Sorry, my oh, 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 why? Just use the dissect the directory, so it doesn't make it simple. Just the, the nose put like a cigar, put the, the teflon in the tip of the micro dissect. I will just move the directory, it's very easy. That means easy, less instruments in the surgical field. And the number three, no, I mean, when I say you should finish the surgery in short time. I never push you. I didn't mean I, I push you to the surgery to finish it quickly. Instead, every single step should be performed methodically, methodically. So that means making the routinely. For example, I said every the, the exposure is everything for this surgery. This is a small room. We should uh, obtain a surgical corridor first. So the beginning, I mean. Those pre microscopic procedures should be not ignored. Some soldiers just say, That's not my job. That's my first job. You do that. I just, when you uh, scrub in, I just, uh, when you microscope in, I scrub in. So that's not good. So every step should pay attention, even the position. Like I would suggest that this position. You know, the Chinese people is okay. We don't have obesity problem. Some foreign and Western people get a very large body. Very large shoulder. Well, uh, I'm just take you are uh, excess. You are right hand. You you can move it. So make it, uh, some room for you. So before you make incision, you should keep in mind that you are excess. That the facility you are procedures, the position and the incision. You should make a right incision. It's very should be very close to the sig sig sigmoid sinus. Sometimes the hair lies very medially, but you, for cosmetic, we just follow the hair line. But we can cut the, the muscle more laterally. So that's the uh, uh, keepers for cranial to me, very close to the 
sigma mode signs. Sometimes you can open the cell. It's okay, just put some vex. It's a safe. And the duratomy, put more dura in this side. That means can protect the cell balance and leave a uh, small one in this way. It's, it, as soon as it can be stitched, it's okay. So this is the step so we should pay attention. So in Chinese idiom, we said gliding or sharpening on X. When you should cut the firewood, you, you should uh, sharpen the uh, chopper first. So that means save your time, actually. And uh, I would say a lot of people, they, they know to expose your deflation now, they will go this way, last tree. And uh, I would suggest the colder, larger approach from colder to the larger. So this is acceptable for chemical facial case. People say it's okay, we just go low. But a lot of people just uh, for the trigeminal case, they go this way. They allow the tentorium, but there's the problem, they got some of the tech, that means properly you are approached. There's lots of petrol vents. Sometimes you cut payments, you will get the last outcomes. So for trigeminal cats are also in this way, from this way, open the petrol cell fissure, or we call, say this is a cellular fissure, open it, like a savage fissure, open it. And I'll show you a movie. This is the right side, can be facial cats. This is the eight and sevens. And uh, I just uh, uh, cut the arachnoid chaperone. This is the petrol vans. I don't, I didn't, I never go this way. I go, I also go coverly to the lottery. So after you open the arachnoid surgery, you will find the IEZ area clearly. Even the palm, the palm here, this is a funny archery. It's very clear. It may be facilitate your decompression procedure. You don't need to cut the, to sacrifice this the patient veins. So that means any redundant manipulation should be avoided in this surgery. And for the hemifacial cast, I would suggest always focus on the excel of the seventh root. So that means the extra of the seventh root. So about more than 95% or even more, the chance, the offending archery is here, the conflict card side is here. So when you find the archery, offending archery, you move it, and this time you will find the AMR vanished, the well gone. And also you find a dent or say print in on the nerve. So it's okay, you can finish the surgery. It's okay to terminate. You don't need to make another deception, the lottery, don't do that. So that's it, a retina intact in this case. So you just do this area. So that means safe and quickly. And uh, sometimes the deception should be very medially. You should be go very middle enough to expose you the quantum medullary suckers, like this, this is uh, left side hemifacial spelling. So this is a uh, caudal nerves. This is eight and sevens. This is uh, sevens, nines. So you should go medially, very medial until the, the beginning of the facial nerve. You should expose this area. Even small actually like this, you should pull it. Pull, move it away. It, it, actually, this is the main affecting artery. I already put it away, but also it's better to put some teflon, small teflon here to move the small vessels. And sometimes the conflict could be more inferior medial than you expected, like this case. This is also left side hemifacial spreading case. So nine, eight, seven, nine. So this is affinity already just uh, close to the ninth to be, because the, the seventh is uh, very close to the ninth, the, the rest from the, the palm, the, the, the breast there. So you should go medially uh, last three. 
and uh, how to balance the cure and the safety. So this is the left side of having facial spasm case. So in this case, that was tough because adhesion, the ICA and the PICA also adhered to the petrol bomb, very tired. You can't uh, to, to dissect it uh, away from the bone. Some people would suggest that you just cut some dura to pull it out. So take time to make, just take a risk. I just uh, opened the uh, arachnoid sufficiently slowly, carefully, and even though you couldn't see the um, IZ area, that very medial, because I couldn't rest the cerebellum enough. That's okay. I didn't do that to, to make it, uh, the, the beginning of the, the S node. That's the same as now. S node is behind the cerebellum hemisphere. So, so I just uh, suppose I just follow the same as now medially. I put Teflon bit by bit and I check the uh, electrical physical monitoring. That means I call this is navigation by AMR. If bit by bit, a piece of piece uh, Teflon until the MR is gone, I will finish the surgery. I think that's the safe, the most important the safe. I want to see if I couldn't, I want to do everything to take a lot of time to, to cut it or just to sacrifice the, the actually, no, I didn't do that. So in Chinese idiom, we say follow the wine to get the marrow. If the marrow just behind the, the some leaves, you just you don't need to, to move the leaves first. You just get the wine and follow it, you will find the marrow. So that's the balance, safety, and the cue. So for summary, I would say a successful MVD lies on a prompt identification of the neurovascular conflict which hinges our good exposure, as pushes everything. Number two, a satisfied, a satisfaction working space can be achieved by appropriate positioning of the patient and a proper craniectomy, as well as a rational approach, I mean, from caudal to the nostril. Number three, with a thorough dissection of arachnoids, the cerebellum, can be less enough to expose your more medially without retracting, no retracting, because if you put a good position, the cerebellum can be far away because it's all gravity. Number four, in most cases, the friendly energy can be pushed away proximally without adoption of complicated techniques, no thing techniques, even no glue, not at all, just to push it from last week, a bit move away, move proximally laterally. That's the uh, action we should suggest. To maintain, finally, if you want to maintain the keep the neurovascular separation, less, less Teflon is suggested to press beyond the confidence side, not the, just the confidence side. Just put uh, the Teflon between the nose and the ash. No, don't do that. You should put uh, sometimes between the brain stair and the, the, the ash for hemifacial case. For to general case, sometimes you get a, the, a friendly ash or even a friendly van could be anyway. So that's kind of more complicated. So I would, in one sentence, to finish my presentation, I think. Our purpose is to satisfy the patient rather than to conduct a gorgeous operation. So the process should be completed promptly with minimal interference to the brain. So the less the better, I think. So about two or three years ago, I started the percutaneous broom compression of the trigeminal ganglia. I think this is the kind of surgery we should have suggested because anyway, some people have said it will get a high rate of recurrence because the node can be maybe repaired. But I think if you put more pressure to the ganglion, ganglion is a neural, 
If the gallery damaged it, there wouldn't be renewable. So you should uh, focus the pleasure on the gallery. So far, I found that the, the outcome is similar with the MVD. So I think uh, next time I got a chance, I would uh, talk something about the borough compression surgery. And uh, so my strategy is the simple, the bad, or the less the bad for the MVD surgery. And I have some papers that we, I published for the surgical techniques, as well as some research paper regarding the mechanism or pathogenesis of such um, cranial node hyperaccessibility disorders. Thank you. I think, uh, uh, okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Professor Zhongjun. And uh, I think your surgical uh, philosophy actually it's uh, uh, just the same as uh, Professor Yuha Hernesnemi. And uh, he always said that the surgery should be uh, simple, clean, clear, and preserve the nature anatomy. So thank you for your presentation. And uh, you. I see your uh, and uh, you presented uh, the surgical field is very clean. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So also, actually, mm -hmm. I submitted such paper. Uh, the review said just like uh, yes, no, sir, I'm sorry. The the the, the janitor said this kind of surgery MVD should be simple, the bad. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that's, that agree with my philosophy. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, definitely. I would like to congratulate Professor Chun Zhong for such a wonderful presentation. It was very interesting. Also, Thank I would you. like to raise my concerns about the failure rates in uh, larger ectactic arteries, which produce either hemifacial spasm or trigeminal neuralgia. What is your failure rates? Because uh, just putting a Teflon may not suffice sometimes. So uh, what is your experience in this regard? For a very large twist uh, vertebral artery. So large is OK, but the twist is a problem. The harder twist uh, torture artery is a problem. Large is OK. Large we, means we have more chance to move it. Uh, just that uh, we open more and recognize uh, we can move it. Move it, uh, put some Teflon from the last week to the colony is okay. So you can solve the problem. You don't need to think uh, some complicated techniques. Easy is bad. Yeah, thank you very much. This is my course, mm -hmm. Dr. Liu Bunche. Yeah, thank you, Raja. Uh, thank you, Professor Junzong, for a very good, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I want, want to find out from Professor uh, regarding doing minimum. So when you find uh, an offending vessel and you 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 uh, separate it from the, for example, trigeminal nerve, do you still need to uh, check from the gastrin ganglion down to the root entry zone to ensure that there's no other offending? Uh, so you may miss something. So we did they consider uh, doing extra steps or uh, still uh, minimizing uh, the surgery? Uh, my second question, uh, Professor, is uh, regarding. Uh, the hemiphasia spasm. Uh, do you always uh, use the intraoperative monitoring uh, uh, to, to ensure there's no uh, lateral spread response to ensure the success of your surgery? And my last question, Professor, since you said that uh, try to avoid using uh, additional material, do you make use of the arenoid uh, surrounding structure to mobilize the structure and to glue it somewhere? Professor, thank you. Okay, you got three questions. Number one, so you mean when we do the trigeminal case, if we couldn't find any affected artery, even no vein, no artery, so what should I do, right? No, uh, my question is, if you found one artery, how are you sure that artery is the offending artery? And we use, try to look for any other artery along the, the trigeminal nerve to ensure there's no other artery, whether sure, they consider sure. minimum step or... or need to be done. Thank you. Yeah, so it's different with the hemifacial cast. For three geminal cast, I will chuck everywhere along the, 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 the root, into cranial root cause. Because for three geminal cast, there's a, it can be happened anyway around the nerve cause. So I will check all the nerve for three geminal cast. But sometimes we couldn't find any affecting no, no coverage. 
Mm. So in that case, I just uh, use some kumi, you know, some very sharp uh, knife to mm. make a, to means newly nourishes kumi. Mm. It's okay, no noun is after surgery. It's okay, it's a work. But now I just prefer to the, the balloon compression. I would suggest that I so So that's the first, your first question. The second question, so I always use the monitoring, monitoring, but I always to dissect me until I saw the, 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 the IZ very medially. Mm -hmm. If I saw the very medially, very caudally, mm -hmm. if that time we got still some um, positive MR well, it's okay, I finished the surgery. Okay. So I believe my, uh, my eye first, but sometimes I would just uh, refer to the MRR, uh, the well, like mm -hmm. my last uh, slides. So mm -hmm. that's it's very difficult to, to expose okay. you. So yeah. your last question, yeah. I'm forgot. <laughs> uh, 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 you utilize the arenoid around the structure to mobilize it. So do you try to, you start, there's start some uh, surgeon that use the arenoid to, su to suture it somewhere rather than using sling. So do you make use of the arenoid to this, uh, this position or reposition arteries or structure? Adhesion, like adhesion. The, the, yes, yes, for the arenoid surrounding the structure, you make use of the arenoid to reposition the structure, vessel. Do you have uh, use for, that technique? For the, page, the case, we put some teflon. So mm -hmm. I got the chance for the recurrence case. Mm -hmm. uh, oh boy, there's lots of adhesion. It was tough to do the operation, but I still I don't have the chance to open the case. I just put some Teflon. Oh no, I mean just some Jeffen without Teflon. Okay. I, I didn't have the chance to really open that case. Okay. Okay. There has been a question from the audience. How many cases of hemifacial spasm you see tumors causing HFS? And what is your take on the position of patient surgery in sitting position? So you the secondary, uh, hemifacial spasm case, right? So caused by tumor in the CPA. So it's not much, but an uh, interesting. I never found acoustic neuroma cause hemifacial spasm. No, very little, uh, seldom because I think the schwannoma that means. Uh, make the, the protection for the nerve from the artery. I got some, most of the case is the epidermoid, the number one. Number two is the medioma. That means the tumor outside the nerve to push the vessel to the, to, to the nerve. So that's the problem, that's the etiology. Not the tumor himself, itself, tumor. Uh, get very less chance to cause the hemifacial spasm or to germinal neuralgia. Well, and what is the take on sitting position? MVD in sitting position. The patient patient in sitting position to to, to finish the MVD. No, I never do that. I, will, I sometimes I would put the patient in super position, which is germinal case. It's okay, but I never put the hemifacial case. Because can be facial, the facial nerve is more low compared with the trigeminal. Trigeminal nerve is top. The facial nerve is uh, uh, caudary. So I should uh, expose more caudal area. So I will put the, the side position to, to lower down the top of the patient's hand. So for trigeminal care, supine is okay, but sitting position is uh, not good. Right. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Professor Junzong, for the wonderful presentation. Before we conclude, I would like to go back to our chair to say his concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the last question for you is, do you use glue to keep artery away from Teflon used for Professor Chung Jun? Yes. So, so very seldom, very seldom I'll use glue. Mm -hmm. But I will try to do just a Teflon, just a Jeflon is okay, number one. Number two, in most cases, I use the Teflon. And uh, the last choice, I will use glue, very seldom. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, 
for tonight's uh, webinar, uh, there's around uh, 1,700 pe uh, people read the flyers of today. And uh, finally, se uh, around 700 audience attend this webinar. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will wind this session up on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yukikato. I would like to thank both the speakers for today, Professor Ki Park and Professor Jun Zong, as well as the Chair, Professor Zubin, for taking their time and teaching us about the respective of socialities today. Thank you so much, all the distinguished faculties who joined. Thank you, Dr. Liu Bunseng, for my course today. Until we meet on next uh, 17th, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you so much.